Yo, what's going on YouTube and welcome back to Goal Line Hockey. It's your boy Kevin Forte and today we are taking a look, of course, at the New York Islanders. It's talking a lot about the Metro here. Uh, we just finished a video about the Devils, so after this video, make sure to check that out. We talk about the Devils and they're actually having a pretty good season, so quick plug to that. But with that out of the way, the New York Islanders, guys... Having a pretty good season so far. It kind of looked weird out of the gate. They struggled through that first six-game stretch. But since then, the Islanders have looked like a different team. And we're going to talk about that today. So the New York Islanders, it's kind of an interesting story here. You know, you look at the first 14 games of the Islanders' season. The record looks really good. It at one point was below 500. But... They found a way to get out of it. And I talked about this a lot. October seems to be a weird month for a lot of teams, especially teams with playoff aspirations, because sometimes they get too ahead of themselves one way or the other in terms of, you know, we want to win every game, but you have to worry about winning on a nightly basis. Instead of worrying about going winning a six getting a six game winning streak, just focus on winning one game at a time. And some teams kind of get caught up in that. And I think that the Islanders have done a good job so far and not really letting things get too high or too low. When you look at their last couple games, there was a clear indication of that. So the Islanders' big storyline going into the year was, yeah, the Islanders probably won't be very good. But there's always that, you know, with a new new head coach, a new voice behind the bench in Lane Lambert. He's been an assistant behind Barry Trotz uh, since he was in Nashville or Na uh, Washington. There's always that assumption there that something could be better right and maybe Blaine Lambert is the right guy for this team right now and you know what so far that could definitely be the case for the New York Islanders so let's start off with how their season has gone so far so game one home game number one of the season I was there unfortunately against the Florida Panthers and they lose the game three to one it was a tough game for the Islanders um it was 2 nothing most of the game for the Florida Panthers, kind of a sleep fest. And that's been a theme for the Islanders, where they're just not seemingly playing most of the game. And then they just show up. And they started playing well in the third period against Florida. They scored a goal, so it was 2-1. And then, just like that, Patrick Hornquist scores a weird wraparound goal. And it's 3-1 Panthers. And the Islanders don't get any closer. Oh, no. Hold on. It was one nothing most of the way for Florida. Then the Islanders tied the game all the momentum was back in the building, and within a minute or two, Florida scored that goal to make it 2-1, and I called it, but of course, Matthew Kachuk had to score a goal in that game and make it 3-1, to the empty netter, in his season, or his debut as a member of the Panthers, a 3-1 to loss for the Islanders. Then they played the Anaheim Ducks. I really wanted to go to this game, but it didn't work out, and uh, the Ducks got thumped. Um, a 7-1 to victory for the New York Islanders, a... A touchdown put up on John Gibson and the Ducks. Gibson looks frustrated. That's been a theme for him so far. Uh, it seems to have calmed down just a little bit, but definitely on that East Coast road trip, you could tell he was PO'd with how his performance with the team in front of him was kind of, they did not play in front of him all that much. Uh, the San Jose Sharks, a 5-2 to two victory over the Sharks, a 4-1 to one loss against the New Jersey Devils. So they start the season 2-2. Two and two. And then they head down to Florida. And you would think that is the death sentence for the Islanders. And it kind of was. 5-3 to three loss at the hands of the Tampa Bay Lightning. A 3-2 to two loss at the hands of the Florida Panthers. And everything seemed to be going from bad to worse for the Islanders. 2-4 and four through that first six games of the season. Kind of defining the season as a just frustrating start through October. They just couldn't find a way to get things going. And that seemed like the perfect time for the Islanders to play. Their crosstown rivals, the New York Rangers, as a way to kind of surge and kind of get some momentum. And the Islanders definitely did that. The New York Islanders played the New York Rangers a 3-0 shutout for Ilya Sorokin, his first shutout of the season. The first shutout for the New York Islanders, a 3-0 victory, sending the home, uh, the away Rangers fans on the trains back into Manhattan a little bit bluer than usual. Um, they went down to Carolina put a thumping on the Hurricanes, a 6-2 to two win for the Islanders. And then the start of the Cardiac Islanders. The Islanders down 3-1 to one in the third period, are going into the second intermission. 
at UBS Arena, and the Avalanche were kind of dominating most of that game, and then the Islanders just flipped the switch and said, we are going to play this game, and we are going to win this hockey game, scoring a bunch of unanswered goals, four unanswered goals for the Islanders to make this game 5-3. to three. They would end up giving another late goal. Uh, I think it was Newhook or something with like 30 seconds left, so a goal in garbage time, 5-4. to four. The Islanders started the trend. A 3-1, down 3-1 in the secondary mission and coming back. That was the first time the Islanders did that. And that place was roaring. And I'm annoyed I wasn't able to get there, but I was a little preoccupied over in Penn State. So, whatever. It is what it is, but a huge win for the Islanders nonetheless. Then the Islanders start a Midwest road trip going to Chicago, St. Louis, and Detroit. And the Outers were able to take care of two of those three games. And pretty handedly, they took care of the Blackhawks, a 3-1 to one victory for the Islanders, a pretty solid performance on the road. They beat the St. Louis Blues 5-2, to two, and pretty much like everybody else in the league, kind of pissing off Jordan Bennington and you know hit, punching Ilya Sorokin. He kind of... He kind of took the second dub afterward when he was asked about it, and Sorokin said, yeah, I, was, I kind of laughed. I thought it was kind of silly and funny that he was trying to get under my skin. And the Islanders took two dubs that night, thanks to the, the mental trench warfare of Sorokin. They did end up, you know, they couldn't go undefeated on this road trip as they lost to the Red Wings 3 to nothing. So at that point, 12 games into the season, the Islanders are 7-5 and five on the season, and they just snapped a five-game winning streak. But the Islanders, for the most part, and even that Red Wings game, like, they, you know, there was some issues with the Sezikis thing and, you know, some bad calls. But at the end of the day, the Islanders just didn't deserve to win the game. They just didn't. They couldn't score a goal. You know, like, it was just one of those days. And that happens. Welcome to the National Hockey League. It happens. You can't win many games if you don't score a goal. Sorry. That's how it works. Um, the Calgary Flames. So this game, I'm lucky I was able to go to. I was able to go to this one, and the Islanders, you know, for the most part, again, they kind of looked just stale most of the way. You know, in the first period, Calgary dominated. It was like shots were like 17-5 to five at the end of the first period, but somehow the Islanders were only down 2-1. to one. There was like one bad break from Calgary, and the Islanders capitalized on it, and Sebastian Ajo put it over Markstrom, and the Islanders end up scoring a goal that was critical because they looked awful, and that was the one opportunity Calgary actually gave them in the first period, but the Islanders were able to answer that call, and it was a huge goal for the Islanders and kind of kept them in the hockey game. Once again, in the second period, things looked a little bit different, but for the most part, dominated. You look at the shot chart, and you're like, oh my God, they are dominating the Islanders. This is like 2016, 2017 Doug Waite New York Outers, you know, giving up 50 shots a game. So they're down 3 to 1 in the second intermission. Oh, does that sound familiar? That's right, because just a week or two prior when they played Colorado in the same building, they did the same exact thing. The Islanders again, halfway through the period, you kind of there in the third period, and you started think I I could tell people were like, should we head out early? Calgary's got a good defense. Markstrom's in between the pipes. Islanders have no offensive, you know, potential here. They're screwed. Until they rattled two goals in within two minutes. And all of a sudden, that stadium was roaring. UBS Arena picked up the momentum a little bit. And the Islanders end up taking the game to overtime. Dobson with a beautiful goal. Now, I know there was some confrontation with the fans there in Calgary. The fact that maybe there might have been a little bit of a slew foot there by Sezikis. Sezikis has definitely been playing on the edge this season. I didn't see it at the actual game. I was staring at it. I just, I didn't think Sezikis is the one that tripped him. But obviously on TV, you, it makes a, it's a little more clear that he did. But again, the f that's after they gave up the lead, and there was a fan there was one penalty call, and I get that because the next game I'm going to talk about against the Rangers, there was plenty of of penalties against the Islanders, and Rangers fans still complained about the one call that they didn't call, and that's again it, it's just stupid. So the Islanders end up winning that game four to three in overtime. Dobson with the winner, and the Islanders are back on the winning side of things, eight and five on the season. The next game is a trap game. Absolutely a game against the New York Rangers at the Garden. You just came off of that game. You know, the Rangers had a couple of nights off where they lost a pretty tough game against the Red Wings. In kind of the same fashion, the way the Islanders beat the Flames was done to the Rangers 
against the Red Wings. Uh, they were up by a couple goals in the third and blew that lead to the Red Wings at MSG. And they were home, no travel. The Rangers were well-rested. The Islanders played the night before against a physical, tough Calgary team. This is a game the Rangers... This is a game they shot. They should have won. But again, you have Semyon Varlamov, who had four straight shutouts of the, against the Rangers, which is a record that goes back to, I think it was the New York Americans, who was the only other goalie to do that at the Garden, which is just absolutely in, insane when you think about it. Um, but the Islanders were in for a test. And I end up going to this one as well. I went to both of these crazy games. I'm very happy to say that. But things uh, started off kind of, kind of. It was kind of a chess match in the first period. It was throwing punches back and forth. The Islanders end up getting the first goal, big power play goal by Kyle Paul Mary. And listen, you know, I know a lot of Ranger fans show up to UBS Arena for the Islander games. There was a lot of Islander fans over at MSG. That was pretty exciting. I have to say, I I didn't feel le- I didn't feel alone. Let's put it that way. And shout out to some of the Islanders fans that were next to me. But, um. It was 1-0 Islanders, and then the Rangers respond. I think it was Philip Hedl ties the game at 1, so the Rangers getting some momentum. But overall, at the end of the first period, I think both sides, okay, we didn't play a great period. We were able to even the score. It's 1-1, clean slate second period. Well, the Rangers took advantage of that in the second period, and this is that period where the Islanders, it seems like every game, they have one period where they just play awful and it's like they took off that period and this was the second period in that game against the rangers they just didn't show up and they ended up scoring two goals a couple of phantom calls in my opinion from the rangers but listen so you they were up for debate and they called them and that's what happened and then the islanders score goal 14 seconds into the third period by pellick we'll see pellick maybe score in january again but that's not what he's there for. The Islanders get within one. Nelson on the power play. It's not Brocktober, but it's close enough to Brocktober. He's playing very well. He's maybe a little bit late to the party. Um, but he scored a huge goal to tie the game. And all of a sudden, everybody was sitting on their hands at the Garden. It was incredible. And then, of course, Andrews Lee. A phantom Oliver Wallstrom trip where it kind of looked like Kako dove a little bit. And that's partially why they called it. Not to mention the Rangers already had like five or six power plays in the game at that point, and the Islanders only had like two. Again, you could say, well, that shouldn't count for anything, but it does. This is hockey, and, and that's kind of how that goes. Um, so the Islanders win the game, and everybody's going to complain that the ref didn't call this. The Rangers still, they gave up three goals in the third period. And, you know, I hate to even, you know, if that's the excuse to cop out. I know refs are an easy cop out, but it shouldn't have been close. If the Rangers scored on another power play in that second period, it's 4-1. I really don't think the Islanders come back in that game. Because even throughout most of the third period, the Rangers were playing very well until that that goal that tied the game. And that's where everything just kind of went stone cold. And everybody was like, ooh. And I think everybody in that building was shocked, including the guys in the Lady Liberty jerseys for the Rangers. Because if the fans are shocked, that's not to be surprised. The guys on the ice looked a little bit shocked and a little shell-shocked at the fact of what the Islanders had just done to them. A game where they had the game, the Islanders on the second night of a back-to-back where they had to fight their way into overtime the night before on home ice. All the physicality against Calgary. And the Islanders still found a way to score three goals in that third period. And it was just one of those games where you're just, as a Ranger fan, you're just stunned. And the crazier thing, and I might even have to make a whole video on this. I mean, Igor Shesterkin's record against the Islanders is brutal. And you started to hear the Igor chants. He is he has one win against the New York Islanders in his career. He is one seven and one against the New York Islanders. And that one win was last year at UBS Arena where the Islanders had a, a defense of like Thomas Hickey, um Mitch like some of these AHL guys coming up. Like it was not the Islanders defense. And that's the one win he has against the Islanders. And remember that game where they beat the Rain you know the, the Rangers beat up the Islanders last year in the springtime, the Islanders had, roster was depleted and screwed. The Rangers had brought in guys like Cop and some of those other guys. They were playing well, but Georgiev was the goalie in that one. It was not um, uh, Shesterkin. 
So with that said, we are done with that talk. But the Islanders, listen, the schedule continues on. The Islanders have played well to this point, but you can't keep winning games that way. That is not a recipe for success. The Islanders have to be better. And that, you know, you could just say that, but they do. They really do have to be better here. You know, the good news for the Islanders is they get a little bit of a, not a break in the schedule, but they play some favorable opponents. Arizona is not very good. Actually, fun fact, at the making of this video before tonight's game, the Islanders, uh, nobody has scored on the Arizona Coyotes roster. Nobody has scored a goal against Ilya Sorokin. I expect that to change tonight, but as going into this game, nobody has scored against Sorokin. They play the Arizona, uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, who have gotten their ass handed to them a couple of times this season. Ottawa has kind of fallen back to the middle of the pack, even a little bit below that. Uh, Nashville, kind of an interesting story there in that Central Division. It just seems like a toss up, but they're five seven and one. They're not that great. Um, you know, Dallas is. You know, they've got eight wins on this season, so they look a little better. Toronto doesn't look that great. Edmonton has looked okay. And then they play Columbus and Philadelphia in a back-to-back. So really until, I'm going to say until they play New Jersey, Carolina, and Boston at the end of this year, in at the end of December, the Islanders' schedule here is fairly favor, ugh, is fairly favorable. Now you can look at that one of two ways. The, a lot of these teams, their record isn't very good. So you could say, well, those should be easy wins for the Islanders. Or you could look at it as those teams are already backed up into a corner, back against the wall, and are going to be very vicious and desperate and trying to find a way to correct their season before it's too late. So it's one of those ways. It's, that's how things are going to go most of the next couple weeks for the Islanders because you know, the Flyers have played fairly well, but they've even come down to earth a little bit. They've beaten Chicago. St. Louis doesn't look that great. Like I said, New Jersey is kind of the next big team that they play. But again, that road trip, Ottawa, Nashville, Dallas, and Toronto, it's not necessarily easy. Um, but I think it's important these next two games for the Islanders to play some good. They have an opportunity to just dominate, like 60 minutes of good hockey. You don't have to dominate all 60 minutes, but look like you're don't look lethargic for 20 minutes. You can't afford to do that throughout the season. And against Arizona and Columbus, you can build some of that momentum, build some good habits, and kind of get back. Again, I don't want to say back in the winning ways because they've won seven of their past eight games. But I think it's more along the point of you want to see them be more consistently playing well. And a power play that has not been very good has looked extremely good the last couple of games here against Calgary and the Rangers. So there's something to build momentum off of. You know, these are two momentum-building games for the Islanders going on to the road before Thanksgiving. And again, these are winnable games. The Islanders have to take advantage of that um, because, like I said, they have a little stretch there. They play Columbus and Philadelphia twice. Those are three those are swings in games. You know, you give two points to Philadelphia, that's two points you didn't get. Same thing for Columbus. If you give them two points, that could be two points that you're not getting and giving to a team in your division. You cannot afford to do that. And I think this is a huge stretch for the Islanders to show what they are this season. And, you know, some people think to prove them wrong. I don't think that's necessarily the standard. I think the Islanders have a little more respect than that at this point. Yes, they had a bad season last year, but I think, pretty you know it's still not that far in the rear view mirror of what the Islanders did in 2020 and 2021 so to think what they can do this year is absolutely in the realm of you know is the Islanders team we saw two and three years ago the real Islanders or is the team we saw this past season the real Islanders and I think you could say that this year will be that defining moment for the Islanders if last year was a blip on the radar or if that is a little bit more of what the Islanders truly are. There's still concerns about the Islanders, absolutely, in terms of the goal department. That always concerns me with this team. Um, you know, you look at their penalty kill, well above average, 86.96%, which is just, I mean, that is disgustingly good. I, I would say that's probably toward the top in the entire league um, because the league average is only 78%. Almost 87% on the penalty kill is 
ridiculously good. But the penalty kill, I mean, the power play is always a problem for the Islanders. That just seems to be the thing. It's gotten a little better <clears throat> the last couple of games here. Two goals against the Rangers on the PP definitely helps with that, but still. Uh, but we're seeing the big guys contribute for the Islanders. You know, Nelson with 15 points, Barzell, who does not have a goal yet, still has 15 points, which is mind-blowing. I swear, I thought he was going to get a goal against the Rangers. He still played very well, though. Um, Anders Lee with 14 points. He leads the team in goals with eight goals on the year. The captain producing in the big moments. Got the game winner the other night. Kyle Palmieri has all of a sudden turned it on. He scored against the Calgary Flames. He scored against the Rangers. So he's been on a little bit of a hot streak. Uh, Zach Parise, Walsh, Jumbo Villiers, uh, Pajot, Pollock, all those guys are producing for the Islanders. And that's something to be very excited about. And of course, the goaltending, which is obviously the hallmark of this hockey team. And when you look at where they sit overall, they're sitting in some good company. Uh, Semyon Varlamov save percentage 913 and Sorokin save percentage at 933, which puts them at a 926 save percentage and a 2.45 goals against average, which is incredibly solid. The Islanders goaltending is a huge piece to this team. And you look at the league average in terms of goals, you know, their save percentage, the average in the league is 901. The Islanders are currently getting Almost 20, yeah, 21 points above that, which is incredible. The Islanders are great in between the pipes. We knew that for really for the last three years now. The Islanders have been spoiled with that, with just how good Varlamov and Sorokin is. I think a lot of that also contributes to the fact that, you know, I think Piero Greco is no longer there, but the goaltending coaches that are still there are obviously a huge factor in that for the Islanders. And they're doing extraordinarily well. Um, I think Piero Greco is still there. I think it's Mitch Korn that's no longer there. One of those two is no longer there. Um, but they turned around Varlamov. They built Sorokin from where he already came from in the KHL, who was a dominant goalie. You know, it's, I have to say, good times for the Islanders. Now, here is my concern. So there's always that concern, right? Now, what's interesting is the Islanders actually, their goals for is seventh in the league, which I don't think I've ever seen that that high. The Islanders are a little bit more run and gun than they've been in the past, right? Under Lane Lambert, Barry Trotz was much more, we didn't give up goals, but we didn't score a lot of goals. And Lane Lambert has found a way to keep that same mentality and structure, but letting the boys wheel it a little bit more. In terms of the defensemen pinching a little bit more. Adam Pellick would have never scored the goal that he scored against the Rangers the other night if he hadn't pinched down like he did. In a Barry Trot system, he would have been glued to the blue line and would have never gotten into the in between the circles to even take that shot. That would have never happened. But those are the opportunities that maybe the Islanders have taken some risks, right? They gave up a a, a breakaway to uh, Jimmy VC the other night. Those things didn't happen under Barry Trotz, but they're scoring more goals. They're much more balanced, and you could see that. Goals for 49th in the league, goals against, oh no, 7th in the league, and goals against 8th in the league. So it's not top 2 in goals against like it normally is, but they're actually scoring goals, which is, I think, something that matters here. So the only injury as well is to Cal Clutterbuck. He sustained it the other night against the Rangers. Um, oh no, he got hurt in, Cal in the Calgary game. And was out officially for the Ranger game. So we'll see what happens with Clutter. Um, he's kind of been in and out of the lineup already to start the year. He didn't start the season. He was injured. And now he's already back out injured again. So that is the only injury for the Islanders. And that's what makes you concerned. If they lost one of those big guys scoring, does that really hurt them? So... Again, we'll see what happens. They're getting some great goaltending. They're scoring some goals. They're a little bit more offensive-minded, which I'm okay with if they're winning hockey games, right? So we'll see how it works out. I think the Islanders can get back to the playoffs, especially when you look at the division, the fact that Pittsburgh's fallen off a little bit. Carolina looks a little wheezy. Same thing for Washington. They look like a tweener team. But teams like New Jersey and Philadelphia seem to be a little better than maybe people expected, so they could be challenging for the playoffs. Columbus doesn't really seem like they're all that much in the conversation, which is a good thing for the Metro teams, just one less team to worry about. But for the most part, this division is still very wide open, and I think that 
you know, when you look at the standings, you know, it's it's Devils, Islanders, Hurricanes, Flyers, Rangers, Caps, Penguins, Jackets. So it's not necessarily that far off from what I predicted. You know, Pittsburgh struggled. Washington seems to be there, you know. It's definitely going to be interesting to see how things play out. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. What do you guys think of the New York Islanders so far? Are you happy about the way things have gone so far? I know there's been some very entertaining games, highs and lows throughout. But let me know what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you again next time.